So can you briefly uh, talk about yourself first? So my name is Dr. Ramsey Salty, and I've been teaching uh, Arabic at Stanford for over 20 years. This is my 21st year here. I love it, but I also host a radio show, which is called Arabology, that airs on um, a radio station here in uh, Northern California. It's called KZSU 90.1 FM. It's a show that I created many years ago because I noticed that there weren't any shows on, on the FM dial uh, that dealt with Arabic music at all. And I got a lot of questions from people. I think it was around the time that the Arab Spring was happening. And a lot of people were asking me about, you know, what is this music about? We keep hearing how music is fueling the revolution. And I felt, well, maybe I can be that bridge because I am American, but I'm also Arab. And so um, uh, through, and I love music. So uh, combining these three things, I started the show. And so this is my life now is teaching uh, in the day, we, you know, Dr. Salty in the day, and then in the evening, I turn into DJ Ramsey, where um, I spin uh, Arabic music of all kinds, not just, you know, the Arabic music we're all used to, but, you know, Arabic hip hop, Arabic jazz, you know, and, uh, and so I, it, it balances me out, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. So can you briefly talk about the classes, your class in Sijal? So this class, which I'm calling, loosely calling, you know, the history of Arabic music, is such a pleasure. It is a class that is very dear to my heart because I'm able to teach Arabic, because the course is in Arabic, it's not in English, and, um, and, and it allows me to, to, you know, use my teaching skills, but instead of concentrating on a book, or a textbook, we're concentrating on music. And so this is, I'm doing it online this year. Uh, last year, I was actually fortunate to be in Amman, Jordan, where I taught the class in person. And it was just such a joy to, you know, wake up in the morning and take the Uber or the bus or whatever and, and get to Sijal and teach a class of international students. Uh, you know, when you teach music, it's, it's not Nice to have that vibe in the classroom this year because of the current circumstances as you know we um, they decided to do it online but they still wanted me to do it so I am teaching the same course this summer online through Sijal with students that are all over the world and uh, I guess the way we're bringing the music in is through the streaming uh, services and we, we use Zoom. And it's it's been going, uh, I think it's going well. It's going well. Yeah. Can you talk about the structure of the class maybe? So I think I, I mean, I, you know, the first year that I did it last year, it was uh, to, to try to see what works, what doesn't work since this was really the first time I'm doing it. And, um, and so I, I, what worked, I think, was the chronological factor so that, you know, to see how music has evolved, it's nice to begin uh, at a certain point in the past and then slowly move up to what Arabic music is today. Um, that part worked, but I think when you're doing it online, you have to reduce the number of musicians or singers that you want to discuss. So if it was had when it was you know a live class in person, um, I would introduce maybe six or seven singers per class, and you know you're moving quickly. Uh, but with the online component, I decided to you know instead of having three singers from Algeria, we'll just choose one um, and concentrate on them, and then also to give the students a chance to present so that they're working on their Arabic proficiency while discussing music. And so what I like about the course is that, yes, I do the introduction, but then I turn it over to the students and they come up with these amazing PowerPoints and presentations about Arabic music. And you can see how some of them are discovering this for the first time. So I'm always thrilled to see or to hear their reaction to Arabic music that they'd never heard of before. Uh, you know, especially the new kind of Arabic music that surprises the new generation, you know, they don't expect Arabic music to be so indie and so alternative, you know, and I think that to me is the future. I'm very proud of this generation. So, um, 
uh, what's your teaching experience at Sijal? So teaching in person at Sijal was, you know, it was like uh, making a new family. The instructors there are so amazing. They're so supportive. They're so hardworking just, you, you know, kindness and generosity. I should also give a shout out to Katie Whiting, who is the heart of Sijal. I mean, she is just such an amazing person, professional, kind, supportive, but also just her personality is very, you know, she's, she's so kind that it's contagious. And I think she creates this um, ambiance, this uh, atmosphere at Sijal of camaraderie and, uh, and mutual respect and so teaching with uh, the instructors last year they became like my family and it was almost sad at the end of the summer for me to say goodbye and come back to California and come back to teaching at uh, Stanford uh, and this year was especially sad because I was looking forward to going back to Amman you know staying with my family and, and, and teaching again so the online has been okay of course uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to next summer and to returning, inshallah, to Sijal in person and uh, teaching this course again to real life students. Yeah, so let's talk about the Arab music. So what do you think is the most special thing about Arab music? So, <clears throat> I mean, Arabic music is so interesting because the whole premise when you're trying to introduce Arabic music is to contextualize it within the framework of, uh, you know, uh, some mentalities or some views that music is not necessarily part of Islam. And I think that the new generation understands that that's really not the case, that music isn't haram, but you certainly have to begin with this discussion is music haram and uh, and if so why and you know things like that but i think uh, you pretty quickly you realize how music has been a staple and has accompanied every major event in the arab world every revolution every colonial encounter uh, has had its uh, has had a soundtrack and the soundtrack lives on so whenever you mention a war you mention a tragedy that happened in the Arab world or in the Middle East, you find songs that to this day resonate. And a lot of them are able to be um, sort of reborn. So that songs that maybe were made, um, you know, for Nasser, when Nasser became president of Egypt, uh, that revolution, those were kind of reborn in the Arab Spring, um, not only thematically, but also in terms of the artists, the, the courage, the standing up to, you know, certain uh, uh, censors, uh, things like that. So um, the, the answer to the question is difficult because each period has a different kind of Arabic music. And there's no way to talk about current Arabic music, especially the one I'm interested in, which is Indian alternative Arabic music, without starting with the greats, you know. I mean, what kind of Arabic music class wouldn't emphasize Um Kulthum, Abdel Wahab, Fayrouz, you know, uh, music of the 80s, even the, the kind of, you know, music that, that dominated in the 80s that was mostly Egyptian, like uh, Amr Diab, uh, you know, this kind of, you know, which was radical at the time and now has become very acceptable. And then moving all the way to what's happening today, which is just this amazing market and these amazing musicians, they tend to be young men and women who are uh, recording music like you've never heard. Uh, they they're not shy to take Western elements of music, but it's always sort of applies to them. They Arabicize it, if you will. Uh, so to me, when I hear this mixture, this fusion between, let's say, you know, jazz and Arabic poetry, and you hear and you see it working so well. Uh, it works on so many levels. So uh, yeah, I mean, I tend to be more of a um, contemporary uh, in the indie kind of uh, music connoisseur, but certainly you have to start with giving the tributes to the greats and then seeing how their music actually still lives on with a new generation. Yeah, so I was in an Arab art class last uh, semester and 
in the beginning of each class, we'll talk about world musician and there's like cultural matches every weekend with the professor. And he oh. a lot of like musicians and I met some uh, band and musicians who improvises and then combine the old Um Kathum sounds and the Faroo sounds with the modern um, elements. That's, uh, absolutely beautiful. So can I ask you, Mohan? I know, I know, I'm, you're asking me today, but wh how did you feel when you heard Umkathum remixed? Uh, I mean, I think it's a good attempt, and I absolutely like like the original songs and the new version. I think it brings um, liveliness to the not like liveliness, but new energy to the old songs and. Maybe a lot of people now think Um Kathum sounds are too long, it's very hard to like uh, take aim, but with the new elements, I think it's maybe more acceptable in the new generation. I think it's a good yeah. I, I agree with you because, you know, when I, um, when I taught at Cixal last summer, they asked me to do a public lecture. So that wasn't just for students, anybody could come. And boy, you know, they, they worked so hard on creating this, you know, outside talk. It was under the, the stars, it was beautiful. And uh, um, people of all generations came, I was so moved. Uh, but the older generation did not quite appreciate, which older generation is me. So my generation didn't uh, quite appreciate um, messing with Um Kulthum, you know. We grew up to hear her a certain way, so to hear her with the hip hop sounds was very difficult to digest. Uh, but, uh, but the younger generation loved it. And I don't know, to me, it seemed like you don't want to lose Um Kulthum. But I, I do hear from the new generation that they're not relating to her music the way my generation did. And so maybe remixing her or uh, repackaging her music will lead a whole new generation to discovering her music and then going back and, and hearing the original. It makes, you know, you have to go that way. You have to start here and take them back to the original whereas my generation of course we knew the original so we're moving uh forward and i'm using them simply as an example obviously we're talking about all the greats um you know uh, in in arabic music so uh yes yeah so is there one musician or one piece of work that you are very the most excited to talk about in class. I see Ferro's poster in your wall. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah. You're very, you're very, your eyesight is very good <laughs> because uh, I placed that before our interview strategically right there behind me. Where is it? Right there behind me. Um, right there and uh, 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 that's actually a digital print uh, that was done by uh, a very talented Jordanian artist his name is Damir Al Ahmar and he gifted me this beautiful poster so it's, it's, it's on my wall but yes I mean I was born and raised in Lebanon and uh, and you cannot grow up in Lebanon in the 60s late 60s and 70s without Fairuz being you know part of your daily routine and when the Lebanese civil war happened in 75 and we left and we went to Jordan, I think we took with us the music of Fairuz as a remembrance of our pre-war existence in Lebanon. And so I, uh, when I came to the States to study, I was 17 and I've been there ever since. And, and so I remember, you know, when I missed home, I would listen to Fairuz cassettes at the time. And, and so to me, Fairuz is pure. Fairuz symbolizes uh, uh, peace and hope and things like that. So I have to admit, when I first started hearing some of these new indie uh, musicians from the Arab world taking a Fairuz song and, and, and turning it into an electronic version, it was a little bit jarring. But then I thought that's actually actually a really nice tribute. It's the way to keep her alive and to keep her in the memory of the, of the new generation. Um, so if you, did you want me to name a song or, or a singer? What, what, what were you thinking? Yeah, uh, you can give some examples. 
So, I mean, in, uh, in terms of Fairuz, I think, you know, there's a lot of remixes out there. And I think everybody does it with such love and honor that even if you hear her sort of being looped in a song, you're not offended. But I do have to say that <clears throat> for me, the music of the Arab Spring is really a turning point in the history of Arabic music because, I mean, I keep saying this, and I may be exaggerating, but I do say it. I don't know if the Arab Spring would have happened had it not been for the soundtrack, for the songs that mobilized people, that got them to go into the streets. And so if I were to pick, you know, the instrumental indie Arabic musicians that uh, started this whole movement at that, and that contribute to this day to the, uh, to, to the genre, of Indian and alternative Arabic music, I would have to say, you know, from uh, Tunisia, we would have to talk about El General, but also about a uh, woman who's become a friend. Her name is Amal Mathluthi. And Amal Mathluthi, who's from Tunisia, you know, was, was in the streets at the time with a guitar singing about freedom with a song called Kilmiti Hurra. I think that that song is iconic. It has become emblematic of revolutions and change. And, uh, and so I think that song to me would be my favorite because it started a whole uh, trend. And then it moved to Egypt with singers like Rami Aysam and then moved to other places in the Arab world. Now, in many ways, the Arab Spring did not live up to our expectations, but the music of the Arab Spring continues, I think, to live on and continues to expand and continues to change attitudes. And, uh, and so I think what politics couldn't do, music is able to do simply by existing. And so those would be kind of like my favorites, you know, Amal Mathlouthi's Kilmiti Hurra. Uh, I love uh, from Lebanon, the band Mashru Alayla. I think they were uh, very fresh when they first came on the scene about 10 years ago. It was just such an amazing sound and they continue to record and to sort of uh, challenge themselves. Um, also from Lebanon, Tanya Saleh is, is a great singer that I got to know. And that's, I think, one of the good things uh, about being a DJ uh, is interviewing these artists. And then if you end up meeting them, uh, they become like family to me. Uh, they're, they're mostly so young that I consider them like my children. But, uh, but I love that part of the quote unquote job is to be able to um, interview them and bring them to the attention of the West and often bring them to the attention of the Arab world because if you're only into commercial music in the Arab world like Nancy Azram and you know these great singers, um, I think a lot of people don't, even in the Arab world, don't realize how much Indie music is happening in their own country. And, and it's very strange for me to hear that. We discovered this singer through your radio show. So people living in, let's say, in Lebanon are discovering local indie musicians by listening to an American radio show that airs in California to get them to open their eyes about singers who may live in the same street as them, but they never heard of them. So I think that's always very rewarding when you hear that you're, um, you know, bringing talent or uh, showcasing the talent of, of these, um, I don't know, um, of these amazing musicians, not only to the West, but to people in the Arab world itself. Yeah. So uh, when did you start to become interested in Arab music or like pursue it as an academic interest? <laughs> So, uh, I mean, I, uh, like I said, I grew up with music in the house. My parents, uh, you know, were, were very sort of, they loved music. They taught me piano at an early age. Um, I wasn't really into the Chopin and the Beethoven when I was learning piano. I would wait for the teacher to leave and then just by hearing, I would play you know, Feirou's tune. So uh, in that way, my interest in music, I think it was born the day I was born in me. Um, but uh, to bring it into academia is challenging. Um, you know, at, uh, at Stanford, uh, there weren't any courses, you know, in Arabic music that were being offered. And since I was busy, you know, teaching courses for the Arabic program, 
uh, I found a chat. I mean, I always would bring in a song for the cultural elements, lyrics, translations, because I think that's a great way of learning a language. But I think around the Arab Spring, I found that, wow, you know, a campus as great as Stanford does not really have any outlet for the indie Arabic music that is fueling the, uh, the Arab Spring. I mean, we would turn on the TV and hear these singers in Midan at Tahrir uh, in Egypt, and nobody really was, there wasn't a course about that music. So since that wasn't part of my job description, I decided to go to the radio, KZSU, which is, of course, free speech radio or not commercial. And I trained to become a DJ and I got FCC clearance. And then I eventually launched my show, Arabology, and I did not realize, I mean, I was doing it for me because it's my passion, but I didn't realize how many people interacted. I mean, the, the, the Facebook page has, I think, close to 100,000 followers. And, and so it, it, I was so proud that, you know, to bring it into academia, yes, because it is related to Stanford. This is Stanford's radio station. Um, and so a lot of academics were listening, a lot of students were listening. But also, I think there was a need internationally to hear in English, somebody speak about the Arabic uh, lyrics and music that, that, that they were seeing on TV. Wonderful. Um, so next question. Yeah, so um, what role does music play in learning Arabic? I guess what advice can you give Sijar students like from the perspective of Arab music? I think that when you want to learn any language, especially Arabic, I think there is nothing like listening to music. Uh, because, you know, the beat and the repetition often, even if you don't understand the words initially, because you've always got this fusha versus amiya, you know, issue. But, um, I mean, if you listen to a song and you like it and you keep repeating it, you, you very quickly increase your proficiency in Arabic without realizing it. So at first you may be just parroting whatever you're hearing, but then you're in class and someone says the word or explains a concept and you're like, oh, that song I was repeating actually means this. So it may not happen as you're hearing, but later it all just comes uh, together. So I think that there's nothing like uh, music to teach a language. And with Arabic especially, there are so many songs in Fusha, and I enjoy those because it helps them learn you know, the same Arabic that they're attempting to learn through the textbook. This is for people who want to read and write, obviously. But then music also allows you to go into the Amiya, the, the different dialects of the Arab world. And so, you know, I think I've I'm comfortable now with the Tunisian dialect, even though I've never been to Tunisia, because I listen to so many Tunisian songs. So I could actually parrot them and sound Tunisian. Now, maybe outside of that context, people will say, oh, no, he's not Tunisian. But, uh, you know, just the, the repeating actually taught me uh, Arab, uh, Tunisian dialect, just the music of, of Tunisia, the, the, the new music from Tunisia taught me that dialect. Same thing for the Gulf dialects, for um, uh, Moroccan dialects, the Darija, you know, that to me sounded so foreign in the beginning, but listening to that music. So again, I think there is nothing like music as a vehicle to learn a language, especially one like Arabic. So don't shy away from that. And of course, YouTube is full, of, you know, filled with um, music videos that have the translation so you can rely on the subtitles in English as you hear the Arabic and even better when you have the sort of karaoke style or not necessarily karaoke but, but when you have the lyrics in Arabic so you can read along. I think that um, really really um, enhances your proficiency in the language you find yourself improving much more quickly than if you're relying strictly on texts and books. Great. Uh, is there anything else you want to share with us? Uh, just that uh, anybody listening to this should go and check out these amazing musicians from the Arab world, from the Mashriq to the Maghrib, from, uh, you know, North Africa to, to the Middle East. I mean, everywhere. Um, 
there are so many and the music i mean you, all you have to do is discover it and you become immediately addicted to it and i'd like you know if anybody's listening um you know to promote their music because they're not commercial and a lot of them are not surviving obviously on the income that they're generating so i'm just always in awe of these young musicians who are doing it just for the passion of it and many of them have other jobs and they're doing this at night and they're staying up all night but then the result when you hear their recording you go wow this is so professional. This is so well done. How did they do this without a studio? You know, it just sounds like it could rival any commercial music. And of course, the themes. So please, everybody, check out these musicians. Check out these amazing new musicians and give them a chance. I think they will change your life. Yeah.